Good afternoon and welcome to our first planning update for rural professionals. Um, on to the introduction. So my name is Nicola Palmer and I'm the marketing manager at the Rural Planning Co. Uh, within my role, I organise our events and webinars. And for anyone who hasn't visited it, it before, our YouTube channel has some excellent rural planning video content and is well worth a look. Uh, we are aiming to hold a planning update twice a year in September and in April with the intention of helping rural professionals understand the latest developments. Our target audience includes professionals who do not necessarily get involved in planning applications themselves, but need to understand changes at base level to best help their clients. We are delighted today to be holding this uh, jointly with Thring Solicitors and I'd like to firstly welcome Fred Quartermain. Fred is a partner within Thrings and has specialist knowledge in planning, development of land and agriculture. Fred is therefore well placed to offer advice on a wide range of subjects, including legis legislative compliance, environmental law, compulsory purchase, heritage and planning matters. When working alongside the agricultural team, Fred works on agricultural planning matters and his cases include those regarding diversification, enabling development and making sure clients remain compliant with local and national policy, legislation and all aspects of planning and environmental law. Our other speaker today is Hannah Moore. So Hannah founded the Rural Planning Co in 2010 and is a rural chartered surveyor and planning consultant with a wealth of knowledge and a huge passion for agriculture and rural business. Hannah also farms alongside her husband in Worcestershire and strives to help farmers achieve their goals through effective use of the planning process. So um, we plan to hear from our speakers first and then we'll cover off any questions from the audience please do feel free to post these on the chat and we'll do our best to answer them within the time. If we're really struggling for time, then we're more than happy to contact you afterwards. So without further ado, I'm going to pass you now over to Hannah, who's going to speak first. If we can make the uh, tech work, let's have a little look. That come up? That has come up, so we just need it in the viewing okay, mode with me is that okay not quite not quite hang on perfect there we go good afternoon everybody um thank you all for joining us we hope that you'll find the next few minutes useful as a, as nicola identified the objective of today really is to try to aim this at those of you who are working in the professional um, sort of in, in the rural professional environment, but not necessarily actually sort of doing planning applications yourselves. But we felt that it would be useful to highlight some of the sort of key updates and what's going on in rural planning. So as that you can have these things in the back of your mind. Um, and, and I would sort of put it as being using planning as one of your tools in helping uh, when you're sort of advising and giving strategic advice to your farming clients. So the idea of today is to highlight some of those things that you can just have. Um, and then obviously, if, if you need more information on them, you can come and chat to us or, or other rural planners. Um, but really, it's there to give you some of those main things to look out for uh, that hopefully can help you with your clients when you're on the farm. So what I'm going to cover today, around 20 minutes or so, um, I'm just going to, to cover the updated Class Q regulations, updated Class R and the new agricultural PD rights. I'm going to tell you what Class BC is, if you've not heard of it, uh, which is another permitted development right. I'm going to briefly give you a couple of thoughts on sort of the Labour government and what they've done with the National Planning Policy Framework consultation, and then just finish off with a couple of my thoughts about opportunities and challenges in, in sort of rural planning. So to start off with, this is a, a recap of Class Q. Now, I'm sort of semi-assuming that a lot of people will have heard of Class Q and sort of know what it is in principle. Um, but to, to, to recap on that point, I suppose, um, in, in England, most types of development, whether that's a change of use or operational development, like building operations, require you to get planning consent or require the landowner to get planning consent. But there is something called the General per Permitted Development Order, which it has a whole raft of legislation which allows certain things to happen without actually getting planning permission, 
um, certain buildings, certain land have these permitted development rights and if they meet the criteria you can undertake certain types of development without actually getting planning consent. Now in most situations you still have to do a prior notification or a prior approval so it still sort of feels like a planning application but what permitted development does is it opens up new opportunities particularly I think uh, under class Q and class R new opportunities that we haven't had uh, sort of prior to them coming in um, and um, they're very useful and, and they can give us good stepping stones for other things so even though it feels like an application in some instances it can unlock opportunities which if we were to go and ask for planning consent we perhaps wouldn't get so a class Q is the change of use of an agricultural building to residential um, and what the class Q part of the legislation permits us to do is to change the use um, of the building and also to undertake any building operations reasonably necessary to convert that building into residential. So you'd be surprised, uh, some of you may be more familiar than others, but you'd be surprised at the types of buildings that we can do under Class Q. Obviously you can look at brick and stone types of buildings, but actually steel portal frame buildings, Dutch barns, breeze block, even like at cost concrete buildings, those sorts of buildings, we can all um, potentially are eligible under class Q. The general principle is that the building must be capable of being converted. So the, the original building, the building that is there now must have um, a, a, a substantial structure. It must be sound and it must be capable of being converted. So, so generally speaking in practical terms that means a reasonably sound roof and a reasonably sound set of walls it doesn't need to be completely enclosed but i would say mostly enclosed is to to our advantage in in class q now um so so that in itself then sort of generally excludes your sort of old timber barns pole barns that sort of thing if you've got a steel frame shed or a dutch barn which is just legs and a roof that normally isn't convertible because the building operations required to convert it would go too far beyond what is uh, reasonably necessary. So a building like this on the picture, something that's pretty chunky, steel frame, even though you think, well, that looks like a shed, not a house. In theory, it meets the, 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 the class Q criteria. So we can look at these for class Q. Now, the government, uh, class Q has been around for a few years, but the government changed the rules back in this summer um, and so from May of 2024, there is now a new set of rules, but they put in to place a 12, 12 month um, transition period. So is that at this point in time, i.e. September 24, we can now apply under the old rules or the new rules or potentially both still for a few months. So what I'm just going to cover quickly are what the new rules are, because obviously we're now moving into the in towards just the new rules, um, although we do have a, a few months still left of the old ones. So under the new rules, um, we can now have up to 10 dwellings per agricultural unit um, and or a maximum of 10 of a thousand square meters. Uh, so a thousand square meters of shed space can be converted into residential, um, <clears throat> excuse me, but a maximum size per unit is 150 square meters, which is it's a reasonable size, it's not a massive house, but it's a sort of good three bedroom house. Um, so, so that's new, under the old rules, we could only have five, um, but there was, but you could have slightly bigger houses. So there's sort of a um, good and bad thing to have come out of the new rules there. Uh, you still can't utilize class Q if you have used your part six agricultural permitted development rights in the last year, ten, um, in the last 10 years. So what that means is that if you have um, used a, a prior notification, used your ag agricultural permitted development 28 day notice, you've got to wait 10 years until you can utilize class Q. There are occasionally little ways we can get around that. For example, we can occasionally do a retrospective planning application for a building that you got under a 28 day notice or your, your clients got under a 28 day notice. So always ask the question. If that's the only stumbling block, ask us the question because sometimes we can get around that. So one of the um, new things that has uh, 
come in and this does open up a, a new raft of buildings is that if the building was applied for and built under a full planning application before the 24th of July last year then it may now be eligible so even relatively new buildings might now be able to be suitable for class Q. There's a few other little things in here which uh, the new rules brought in. We can now extend a class Q uh, by up to four metres if there's a hard surface present to the rear of the barn. That brings in some quirks, but I won't go into that now. And then there's a couple of new rules um, under the, uh, um, that, that has changed. Under the old rules, we, uh, the building had to be an agricultural building on an agricultural unit. Now, so long as it's still on an agricultural unit, even if the building has been used for other purposes since July of last year, then it might now still be um, considered and sort of vice versa. If the building has been sold off or severed from an agricultural unit, but its last use was agriculture, then it might now comply. So that would perhaps maybe be uh, bring some buildings which um, perhaps were um, sold off or something and arguably are not on an agricultural unit or you know were just isolated and by themselves they could now potentially come back into the realms of class Q. The new rules still haven't changed the, the position in that it still can't be a listed building scheduled monument we can't have class Q in a national park A O N B, or a conservation area. Um, the one thing to say is that the class Qs are still hugely varied between local authorities um, even though this is a English permitted development right, they, the, the, there still seems to be a huge variance, no matter how much we, <laughs> we, we, we you know, point this out to the local authorities, there's a huge variance between how they're interpreting it. And these are one of the key, the main challenges that we're finding on the ground. Um, and I'll give you an example of, of our two local authorities here. So um, Hereford are quite generous with their class queues and they're approving 80 or 90 percent, Malvern Hills are only on about 25 or 28 percent of approvals. I actually have a building in at the moment which is an old hot building and would you believe it the boundary between Malvern Hills and Hereford goes directly through the centre of this building so we have had to do two simultaneous applications one to Malvern Hills and one to Hereford. So I have yet to see how that one is going to pan out it'll be interesting to see if Malvern Hills pull their socks up on that one, but um, we shall see. So the other thing to point out uh, that is useful for your clients is that sometimes we can see or use class Q really as a stepping stone. Um, because if, if we go back to sort of, you know, what, what is fundamentally there at the moment, which is an agricultural building, yes, we can put windows in, doors in, we may be able to change the cladding, but it still obviously just looks like a shed with windows, the same shape, the same size, the same location, orientation. But what we can now do in quite a lot of instances is get the class queue first and then apply to demolish the barn and replace it with new build or multiple new build dwellings. There's several advantages of this uh, and it really does open up sort of quite a lot of opportunity. It depends what your client's objectives are in doing it as to whether it is uh, the right route to go down, but it certainly increases value because um, if, if it is a exercise in raising capital or making value out of something, new builds almost certainly and in, in most circumstances will be more valuable than a class Q conversion. Not every time, but I, I'd argue eight times out of 10. Um, and then of course you can redesign it. So, you know, you can make it more energy efficient. Uh, you can just make it look nicer. You could probably put a bit more glazing in. you can put some solar panels on. You can do all sorts of things that you, you probably would, would struggle to do um, otherwise with the class Q. So the downside of replacing a class queue with a new build is that quite often it will bring in affordable housing contributions, which can be a few thousand pounds per plot. Uh, and it can also bring in biodiversity net gain into the planning application. But I just wanted to highlight that it can be a useful stepping stone in going from a shed to a new build house using class queue as the fallback where you wouldn't otherwise be able to get planning for a new build house in that sort of rural location. So we tend to find that we use class queues, and this really is, is now sort of uh, coming back to how you're advising your clients. Um, these can be really useful if your clients are looking at, um, you know, sort of 
family arrangements, whether it's children coming back onto the farm, whether, whether um, people need to be moved in or out of farmhouses, succession, downsizing. And for class queues, we don't have to prove the need for a rural worker's dwelling. We don't have to go into the tests of why you need to be on site and everything. So actually, these can be quite a relatively quick and easy way of getting additional housing on the farm as part of the farming business. The other thing that, of course, class queues can do is uh, massively increase value. Now, if you've got a set of or your clients have got a set of outlying buildings that could be uh, done class queue or redeveloped and sold for capital income, obviously they can be, you know, increase the value quite substantially. That capital amount can come back into the farming business for another purpose. And similarly, you can use class queues for holiday lets or for long term residential income if you wanted to develop them, you know, if your clients wanted to develop them themselves. And in some instances, we do get involved in the complete redevelopment of, of redundant farmyards, either, you know, for a sort of um, under instruction from executors or because somebody's retiring. So we can look at whole farmyards and how to get best value out of those. So moving on to class R, class R is a very useful class of, of permitted development, which is the change of use of an agricultural building to commercial use. Um, I, I won't uh, go into too much detail on this, but just have it in your minds that we can change agricultural buildings to most commercial uses, excluding heavy or sort of general industry. But most other things, storage and distribution, most commercial business, office, shops, restaurants, anything on farm. So uh, there are some things it won't come into, some very specific sort of sweet, generous things like, I don't know, dog boarding kennels wouldn't come into it, for example. But uh, certainly, you know, a large proportion of normal commercial and business services would come into this. Um, and actually, one of the new rules that, that came in in the summer again is that you can now convert up to or, or on a unit up to a thousand square meters of floor space per, per planning unit. So, um, again, it's, it's quite generous. That's two pretty big sheds, you know, and um, it just means that your clients can do this under permitted development without going through the hoops of planning. And I would describe this as being a very useful thing when you can, when you think perhaps maybe neighbours are going to be awkward or you might not otherwise get planning. Um, we can use Class R, which is a relatively quick and easy process uh, to, to change the use. Uh, and uh, we also use it where clients want to do a lot of change of use of buildings to commercial. We would do Class R on the first one or two buildings, for example. You can then run it for a, 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 you know, a year or two. And then when we went for planning permission for more, you will be able to demonstrate that there's been no issues with highways. There's been no issues with noise and neighbours and so on. So it is quite useful to use it at the start of a sort of more strategic long term thing. But again, for farm diversification, this is one to bear in mind. Ag PD, which is new agricultural sheds, really not a lot has changed on this other than to say we can now get up to 1,500 square metres under permitted development every two years. So that shed that you're looking at is less than 500 square metres. So in theory, you could have up to up to three of those every every couple of years. There's, there's not many farming businesses which which need that many sheds, but um, it, that's so it's, it's really quite substantial and generous under PD. We still be have to be able to show that it's reasonably necessary for the purposes of agriculture on that unit. It's not a sort of a free wheel that tick the boxes and you get it. Um, but on what I would describe as you know a, a proper farm, not not a small holding, um, then you know we can normally justify new ag pd sheds reasonably straightforwardly not forgetting don't use ag pd if you want to use class q on the holding um still can't do these for livestock if you're within 400 meters of a, a protected dwelling which is basically somebody else's house uh so if you've got any other questions on that but i'll skip over it um oh i suppose yes just to say ag Agricultural planning is, generally speaking, the easiest planning that we can get. Um, we find it very difficult to get new commercial buildings, farm diversification buildings in the green belt, for example, and sometimes AONBs. So if you have a sort of slightly longer term plan, I would always say get up agricultural buildings if you can afford to do so, and then you can change the use of them down the line. So that's where your slightly strategic longer term thinking comes in. And, and when I say you, obviously, I mean uh, you assisting your clients. 
This is one just to mention, this came in last year, a new permitted development right for temporary campsites, which again is something that your clients might want to consider. It was just, just came in in July um, last year. So now on a, on a unit, you can have up to 50 tents or 50 camping pitches for up to 60 days per calendar year. Um, that's for tents, motorhomes and caravans, You've got to have toilets um, and there is a prior notification, but that's really straightforward. So if anybody is thinking of setting up a camping site or wanting to do something, you can now do 60 days a year without planning, um, you know, which is quite useful if you just want to try it, uh, try out a new venture fairly cheaply before committing to the planning. It's also useful where perhaps maybe we wouldn't get planning, for example, in the green belt. Don't forget that you also that that all land has 28 days a year that they can change the use of. Um, doesn't have to be consecutive. Technically, the original use has to be returned to. Um, a few sort of caveats in there, but again, it is quite useful. You know, we have clients that do seven or eight weddings a year, for example, three or four day weddings without planning. And again, it's useful just to try out something before actually going through the um, the hassle of planning. So I, I suppose I want to just here reiterate that obviously planning, that the act of planning generally is changing the use of something um, and, and normally upgrading something so is that we're, we're increasing value at the point at which we're obtaining planning mo most often. And that is really useful in thinking about your clients from the point of view of raising capital for sale, you know, so as that you can then, they can then reinvest or, or otherwise use that capital. We can raise capital value if they want to retain those assets and then borrow against it. Obviously, we can um, get in planning for things like residential units or commercial storage or anything like that to create a rental income. And then, of course, planning facilitates the right sort of planning facilitates diversified incomes um, and obviously you know, is key to expansion of, of, of sort of growing farm businesses as well. So be thinking about planning and using the, a strategy of planning alongside when you're, you know, thinking about all of the other things that go with um, advising your clients. This is a really quick example of how we can use permitted development rights strategically to help uh, create a sort of diversified income. So looking at this sort of aerial view, what we can do is we can use agricultural PD to get a great bit of Photoshop there, agricultural PD to get one or two more sheds on the site. And then we can hive off this little area here because the little green shed's doing nothing. The straw shed in the middle, we can now use class R to change the use to commercial. So we've replaced that middle shed um, agricultural over on the other side. We can now change that using class R to um, into commercial use. And that generally speaking is going to pay for itself within a couple of years. So, you know, and then you've got a sort of 30 plus 40 grand a year income potentially, depending on how you set that up. Um, but without actually ever having to get planning permission, we've done all of that through PD. So two more slides. One is just to say what Labour and the National Planning Policy Framework consultation has, has been going through. So obviously Labour got in, immediately started talking and making lots of noise about planning and the economy and, and growing and so on. Um, so the first thing that they did was they issued a consultation to revise the National Planning Policy Framework. Um, it very much was focused around house building and it was focused around getting um, a sort of a slightly unlocking the planning system and trying to get suitable sites for development coming forwards more quickly. Um, you'll have heard about these words grey belt. I have to say that I think grey belt is still very much like an urban focus. We're not going to be getting e even brownfield sites, but if they're remote or rural, we're still not going to be suddenly magically turning those into housing, I don't think. Um, there was nothing in the revised or consultation NPPF around rural business. I'm not sure whether that will come in the future. Obviously, you know, lots of people are, are um, campaigning for it, you know, increased PD rights and increased support for rural business. Um, but yeah, at the moment, Labour are really just focusing on large scale house building, rightly or wrongly, um, but uh, but that's what their, their sole focus is about at the moment. So doesn't really massively 
on a day to day basis help loads of our rural clients. Um, but obviously, if you have got clients with potential development land, um, then it might be something that we can get that, you know, where, whereas you might have thought, oh, that's a 10 year site. It might be something that could be brought forward sooner. So if you have got any clients that have got potential development land that you think, oh, it's a little bit near the village or, or whatever, we just need a plan. You can send it over to us and free of charge. We can have a quick look and give you a, a sort of thumbs up, thumbs down as to whether it might have any legs to, to, to take that forwards. And then the last thing to, to just uh, I promised I would say about is challenges and opportunities. Um, challenges there's no two ways about it planning is about as difficult as it's ever been currently it's extremely hard work it's lengthy it's time consuming that's not just on our side planning officers are under a, a lot of stress and pressure too it's very expensive the the last government um abolished the free go so we now have to pay for every planning application so you can't just chuck a planning application in and say oh well if we have to change it we can have another go we've just submitted a dairy building which was best part of twenty thousand pounds for the planning fee so for that one um we had to do a pre-app and everything else and make sure that the local authority were really happy with where it is going before we submit it so there's a it's just adding time and cost to, to, to everything lots of surveys all the time you'll have heard about the delights of biodiversity net gain which is bng now bi biodiversity net gain that the basic premise is that we are taking a baseline habitat on each development site and they want the habitat raised or improved by 10 percent um, by the end of the development. Um, the premise, I suppose, is fine, but the application is a complete disaster. Uh, and there's there's all sorts of things coming out in the woodwork now about how it's being applied. It's creating a lot of hassle, a lot of stress, delays, can't get ecologists. So um, that is a real fiddle. So I'm afraid that's just adding to the woes a little bit at the moment. And then I'm afraid there's still just generally as a point a, a lack of a distinct lack of understanding in the local authorities about the rural environment and so we, we are finding a constant battle in having to kind of um, you know talk to local authorities about why things are different in rural locations having said that and to end on a poor positive note the opportunities I would say that we currently have the best permitted development rights that we've had in in donkey's years class Q class R B C some of the others are very generous really um, and uh, and can give us um, you know lots of opportunities in in things that we wouldn't have had before a really two second class Q example a client of ours had a steel frame shed did a class Q on it um, and then we actually swapped it out to three new builds, centre of Wor uh, sort of central Worcestershire, and we turned that tin shed from worth maybe five grand, and it's now worth best part of a million um, as three new build plots. So it is extremely valuable if you can use it correctly. The other opportunities that are going to come out, uh, and this sounds slightly uh, sort of converse really, over the next year or so are in BNG and nutrient neutrality, which has been around for longer. But I think it will start to tease out now over the next 12 to 18 months. And there will be some opportunities for your landowner clients in creating credits and sort of some habitat type of creation and things. And I'm hoping that that will come into like a smaller way so as that we can do that on smaller sites rather than just these big environment banks that they're dealing with at the moment. So hopefully that will start to tease out and offer some opportunities for our landowner clients but that's me done uh, that was just obviously a bit of a, a, a canter through really um, this is us rural planning co we're very happy to chat to you and all your clients free of charge um, you know if you've got something that you've been out on farm and just think i'd like to run it past them before i speak to my clients please just pick up the phone we're really happy just to chat to you um, and uh, you know see if we can help your clients so um, that's it nick i think Brilliant. Thanks, Hannah. Um, we do just have a couple of questions which are very much related to what you've been talking about. So maybe we'll have a little go through those now. The first question is, can you apply class R on change of use in, of an agricultural field to any of the commercial uses highlighted? Building only. OK, great. Thank you. That was easy. Um, and the other one, can you see a point in time where class R or class Q are extended to include um, AOMBs? Mm -hmm. 
the they've consulted on it they consulted on it in the last round of consultations obviously that was a conservative government that consulted on it and they they consulted on lots of things they brought in pretty much everything else except that so so everything they consulted on they then brought into the legislation except AOMBs and national parks um the CLA are continuing to campaign for it I don't know I don't think it's going to be high on anyone's agenda for the next 12 to 24 months you know they're going to be thinking bigger picture stuff so I can't imagine they'll give it a lot of time certainly in the foreseeable in the short term um yeah I, I don't think so in the short term okay but I'd be surprised okay. anyway yeah okay right let's move on to Fred then and um I'll just swap us over thanks Nicola and and thanks Hannah for, uh, for that um gallop through those uh, opportunities. Um, I'm going to talk today about a number of uh, cases that have been through the planning court in uh, in the recent months, just to highlight a few of the issues that have come out of, the, of that court um, uh, and how they may or may not apply to the, the rural sector. Um, the first case I want to talk about uh, this afternoon uh, is Finch. Um, <clears throat> now, Finch relates to um, EIA development, which is development which has uh, is of a uh, sufficient size to have environmental impacts, uh, and that type of development is covered by the environmental impact assessment regulations. Um, <clears throat> those regulations I won't go into in any detail at all, uh, other than to say. Um, the legislation sets out thresholds and types of development which um, have easily identified environmental effects uh, and uh, if you tip over those thresholds um, there is a requirement as part of your planning application to produce um, an impact assessment um, and uh, this case deals with um, the scope of that assessment. Now in particular this related to oil extraction in the Surrey Hills um, and the particular question that was being asked was in relation to what we call downstream effects. <clears throat> um, this was a Supreme Court case, the highest court in the land and <clears throat> they have very recently handed down judgments in relation to uh, the scope of EIA in relation to in particular oil extraction but it has impacts in relation to any EIA development. So by way of background, um, planning permission was granted um, for oil extraction in the Surrey Hills um, <clears throat> and an application went in to extend the uh, that oil extraction for a period of 20 years. This was back in 2019 um, <clears throat> and as part of that process the council were asked to make an assessment as to whether uh, or not uh, an EIA was required and the developer and the council went back and forth for, for a while. Um, the council's initial, initial position was that all, um, all the effects, all the emissions that would be related to the oil extraction were um, impacted the development and so needed to be included and their starting point was that included um, impacts from when those that extracted oil was um, burnt. so um, the the end user effects um, after the discussion with the developer the council agreed to accept <coughs> an impact assessment which only dealt with direct release of greenhouse gases from the development site and on that basis granted consent 2020, just after the permission was granted, a uh, judicial review was launched um, and this was on the basis that the council had been unlawful in restricting its assessment in that way. Um, the High Court, then the Court of Appeal, um, reached um, conclusions and concluded um, that the council's decision was within the scope of the decisions that it could have reached. Um, so this court case went all the way to the Supreme Court, uh, who were asked 
um, whether or not the council were correct, whether, whether the downstream effects were relevant to the uh, the decision on the impact on the environment of the development. The um, Supreme Court in the majority verdict, um, three to two, so um, five of the most learned judges in the land allowed the appeal and quashed the um, grant of consent. Their conclusion was that subsequent emissions from burning extracted and refined oil were inevitable, foreseeable and quantifiable as impacts of the development. And the uh, decision really is a fundamental shift in approach to environmental impacts. Um, it alters quite substantially the uh, the consideration of, from the council as to whether or not we are just talking about the impacts of development, which has been broadly the accepted um, position, to now considering the whole lifespan of um, of those impacts. It's a decision that will have wide ranging um, impacts on uh, the EIA regime, and it's a decision that we're already seeing the impacts of. Um, particularly in the infrastructure world and um, particularly in relation to fossil fuels. So the, the Cumbria coal mine um, decision that was granted by the previous government uh, and uh, judicially reviewed uh, after the Finch case, the government decided no longer to contest that case uh, and that permission was quashed on, on the same basis, on, on the basis that uh, when you take into account the impact of the burning of coal that's extracted, um, it's impossible to mitigate those impacts in a way that makes that development acceptable. Moving on to um, CG Fry, which is um, a case that touches on habitats regulations and appropriate assessments. And um, uh, I want to talk briefly about this when you talked about our opportunities in terms of um, nutrient um, mitigations. Um, essentially, the habitats regulations provide that you can only grant consent when you are um, certain that the uh, proposed development won't have an impact on uh, protected sites. Um, now, this particular case is um, probably more uh, technical than will need to cover today, but it turns on the difference between planning and or planning permission and uh, a project, because the habitats regulations, although they are um, govern the planning regime, deal with projects which goes beyond the scope of, of planning. Um, CG Fry, a developer, um, they obtained outline consent for 650 dwellings in Somerset. Um, they then went in for um, reserve matters approval and discharge of conditions um, and at that stage the council said we can't determine this because we're not satisfied that um, we're meeting obligations under the habitats regulations and that you, there won't be a, a significant impact. Um, this is because the development itself uh, is in close proximity of Ramsar site uh, um, uh, has impact on the, the River Tone. So the council refused to discharge the conditions on the basis that that appropriate assessment they were required to do uh, hadn't been undertaken and um, the impacts couldn't be ascertained. CG Fry appealed. The Secretary of State reached the same conclusion as the council, i.e. that that appropriate assessment needed to be done uh, at this stage, as did um, the High Court when that decision was challenged. Now, the reason that CG Fry have continued to push this is because the um, the working assumption up to this point was your outline consent grants you permission, and that should only be granted if um, if the impacts are quantified and everyone's accepting that this development could happen. So it was something of a shift for the council to try and um, move this to reserve matters stage, um, notwithstanding that that position was supported then by Secretary of State and by the lower court. 
So CG Fry appealed to the Court of Appeal, um, who perhaps unsurprisingly, um, given the position taken by the lower court, um, agreed. Uh, and the position now uh, is that appropriate assessment should be undertaken at any stage and will need to be a continuing obligation. Um, and again, this, this turns on the fact that the regulations relate to a project and aren't um, tied to the grant of planning consent and uh, each decision at application stage, whether that's outline, reserve matters, um, discharge of condition, is uh, a decision in relation to a project for which the habitats regulations are engaged. Um, and I said earlier, planning is difficult and um, more difficult than it ever has been, perhaps. This is another example of how uh, the system has changed to make it more challenging in recent years. Um, moving on to the third case I want to talk about today. This is uh, Greenfield's Isle of Wight and the Isle of Wight Council. Um, essentially, this is a uh, case which talks about the procedure of decision making. Um, uh, it relates to an approval um, for 473 homes on a um, farm site in on the Isle of Wight. It was objected to by a large number of um, locals, 500 individual objections, 4,000 signatories in a petition against um, and um, subject to two committee decisions initially in 2021 and then again in 2023. Um, the fundamental question asked by the High Court was whether or not councillors had already made up their mind by the time they um, made their decision in 2023 and whether or not that um, le led to the decision being um, biased one, but whether it was procedurally fair. Um, in the 2021 committee decision, the council had gone to some lengths to make sure that they were um, proceeding uh, on a, a fair basis, that they had lengthy discussions on it and um, uh, lengthy uh, um, consideration of which members would be entitled to vote because of various interests in, in and around the site. Um, in 2021, the councillors voted uh, four to three in favour of refusing the application. Um, a decision wasn't issued because um, it was considered that some of the issues around provision of infrastructure and uh, objection from Natural England may be um, uh, overcome and so the final decision wasn't issued. There were further negotiations. Um, in 2023 the application went back before committee and this time was approved. Um, members were advised that the 2021 resolution was a material consideration but uh, obviously there was a conflict between the two and as a result um, locals, the, some of the 500 objections crystallised their objection in terms of a judicial review, um, claiming that the meetings have been procedurally unfair and therefore the decision was unlawful. Um, the High Court um, agreed with the objectors to a certain degree. They agreed that the um, 2021 decision was unlawful, um, that the uh, considerations that have been given to um, which members should take part and then the subsequent decision were procedurally irregular and um, improper. Um, however, the 2021 decision wasn't the final decision and had been overtaken by events, meaning that when the decision went back to committee, they were satisfied that a um, proper decision had been taken and that the uh, impacts of the earlier decision were cured by um, the, the subsequent decision. This case really highlights the importance of process and procedure in, in decision making uh, and that um, planning decisions aren't um, 
wholly subjective. Um, there is um, a wide range of power for decision makers to make um, decisions based on their own judgment, but that judgment needs to be exercised in accordance with um, the development plan or uh, in the case of um, perceived bias on the council in accordance with codes of conduct and uh, registers of um, pecuniary interests, etc. Where a decision is made incorrectly, it is still possible to cure that decision if um, appropriate steps are taken. Um, the fourth case for this afternoon um, relates to um, a long, um, is it the latest in a long line of case law which talks about um, discharge of conditions, essentially. Um, this is a decision that, um, this is the latest decision in a, um, uh, an area of law which has been largely developed by the courts, which talks about um, how long a planning permission can survive in, if conditions aren't discharged or if they're discharged incorrectly. Um, uh, and essentially it turns on the, the Whiteley principle, which is a long established principle, which um, has previously held that provided you submit uh, information in relation to discharge of conditions and you implement in accordance with those um, details, then regardless of whether or not you've had a formal decision in related to those uh, details, provided that decision comes in the future, um, you're not prevented from lawfully implementing your permission. Whereas um, if a pre-commencement condition requires details to be submitted and you haven't done anything, then implementation of that permission will be impossible and works done under that permission won't benefit from planning permission. <laughs> With West Oxfordshire, um, developer had gained approval, um, sought to discharge conditions um, and sought to vary the permission under Section 73 application to bring all the details in line. Um, they implemented in line with um, the submitted details which were to be approved under the Section 73. That Section 73 permission was then approved, meaning that following the Whiteley principle, um, the implementation was lawful. The wrinkle was that that Section 73 permission was subsequently challenged in the courts. Um, when that 73 decision was quashed, uh, the question for the court was, it, has um, the permission been lawfully implemented still? What the court found um, was that the quashing of a, a permission, a discharge of condition, will have retro retrospective effect. What that meant in this case was that the works done under the permission were no longer validly um, implementing that consent. And because of the three year time limit on that consent, it was no longer possible to validly implement that consent and the consent had been lost. What the court did say was it won't always be the case that a uh, decision to quash will relate to a condition which goes to the heart of the permission and therefore won't always invalidate commencement. Mr Justice Morris, who decided this case, did go as far as to say in his judgment this matter did go to the heart of the permission and therefore this permission was no longer implementable. That is um, it's a somewhat curious decision because judges stay away from imposing their own judgments on merits or matters of planning judgment such as when a um, condition goes to the heart of the permission unless they're specifically asked to rule on it. Um, and it does limit somewhat the scope of the victory for the claimant in this case, because ultimately it's clear the council were happy to for this permission to be varied and to proceed in the way it has. Development has started and local planning authority enforcement powers are discretionary. So I 
would expect a retrospective application to be granted in this case, rather than uh, the developer to be um, completely uh, stuck. But the important point is uh, that where uh, it, it's no longer the case that um, you can rely on the Whiteley principle regardless, you need to get through your JR period as well before you can take take that comfort. Um, the final case I want to talk about today isn't strictly a planning case, but um, does uh, raise um, uh, particular issues in relation to um, the, the rural environment. It's a, a case that turns on environmental protection um, and the Supreme Court, again, were being asked whether um, negligence or deliberate wrongdoing is necessary to allow a private claim against a statutory undertaker. Now, in this case, um, <clears throat> United Utilities Water as a statutory undertaker um, were operating under the Water Industries Act to um, move um, uh, water around. There had been a discharge of that water into ship canal. Um, that discharge was uh, entirely within the regulatory framework of the Water Industries Act. Um, notwithstanding that um, it did cause nuisance and damage to Manchester Ship Canal. Through the lower courts, Manchester Ship Canal had been unable to enforce a private claim of nuisance because um, United Utilities were working within their regulatory framework. <clears throat> the Supreme Court found um, that actually it's not required to show negligence or deliberate wrongdoing. Um, that even if a utilities operator is operating wholly within their regulatory regime, it is possible that um, discharges which are wholly foreseen could amount to a, um, <clears throat> a, a nuisance or a trespass. Um, this opens up a, a route to damages where land is impacted by um, neighbouring utilities and is particularly um, topical in light of the, um, the state of um, many, particularly water utilities companies. A note of caution though, the case specifically relates and talks about discharges of foul water into water courses. Uh, there's nothing that stops that applying directly to discharges to other land and um, but for the protections of the uh, regulatory regime they operate in. If anyone else were discharging onto open land, there would be a, a, a likely cause of action. Um, utilities companies probably aren't going to want to give up the ghost on fighting that corner at this point. Though. Um, so it is going to be an emerging area of law rather than uh, an established principle going forward. <laughs> Thank you. That's everything from, uh, from me in this lunchtime. That's Brilliant, thank you, Fred. Um, so we've got a few more questions now. So the first, yeah. why no caravans in BC? So I assume that's referring to Class BC. That would be for you, Hannah. Yeah, so Class, I'm not even sure what Class BC stands for, but um, yeah, Class BC, it, it's basically just a camping um, uh, permitted development. So so there's, there's a difference between the two. And in BC, it's allowing tents, motorhomes, caravans, but not caravans. It's just what it is. Okay. Um, next question is: Can you use both Class R and Class Q at the same time, or does the use of one eliminate the, your rights, basically? Class R and Class Q don't affect each other. Class Q and agricultural PD rights do affect each other, but not Q and R. Okay. Um, can they put any occupational restrictions on Class Q residential? Great question. And no is the answer, which is why they're so useful. Um, so, uh, no, it's open market residential. OK. Um, do you have to justify a Class Q residential application? It's got to meet the criteria of Class Q, which is quite strict criteria. Some of those criteria are objective. Is it a listed building? Yes or no. Is it an A and B? Yes or no. Some of them are subjective. Is it structurally sound? Is it on an agricultural unit? 
as long as you can meet the criteria, then um, it's not, you don't have to justify it in the same way as you would something like a rural workers dwelling. It, it's a set of criteria under planning, under permitted development, whereas obviously under planning permission, it's all about the planning balance and planning policy and everything. So that's the that's the distinction between permitted development and, and a planning application. And that's why class Q can be quite useful. OK. Uh, just bear with me. I've just lost my questions. Um, you mentioned that Ag PD rights are renewed every two years. Are you able to explain the rules behind this? Is it based on the completion date of the previous building or can you just apply for 1500 metres every two years um how, how does that work it, it is about the completion it's when you exercise your pd rights it's from that date so it's not about the date of your application it's from when you have exercised those rights and, and most pds actually have five years to exercise them so so um yeah you've got to think about the dates at which you actually complete the building not just get the prior approval through Okay. There's there's a few there are a few more complexities to PD than what I've described. So obviously today was just quite simple. If yeah. they want some specific, there's 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 a bit more of a relationship between where buildings are and on on the holding and things. So if they want yeah. a more of a chat, then then um, my colleague Sally in the office is our PD queen. She's amazing. Mm. So um, I think we've also got some decent videos that cover some of that off it on our YouTube channel. slightly outdated, but the, I think the premise will still be the same. It might just be the old um, meet square meterage, like it might just be for a thousand square meters, but I think the rest of it should be the same on our videos, yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, a question about the planning summary slides, can they be downloaded? If if you want to, um, the, the video will be, the web, whole webinar will be uploaded to um, the, our YouTube channel and we'll send out some an email with the link to that but if you do want the um, planning slides specifically then please do email um, email us with the events at the rural planning co.co.uk and I'll get that sorted also for you. Also to say though that then like certainly on mine that they're, they're, they're the highlights rather than you know the, the total lot of criteria so to be taken not not entirely as uh, you know they've got to be looked at as a as a bigger part of the legislation minor just yeah so, yeah okay <laughs> don't, don't go to totally off the slides <laughs> no okay um your slide showed a new ag building under pd and then a different building being class r that you suggested could have been used for class r i think didn't you how long after the prior notification building was erected do you have to wait for class r so on that slide i showed us doing a new shed under prior notification and and as soon as that so, so that's to replace the other agricultural building as soon as you have replaced your agricultural building you can apply for class r on the original one the original to, to, to get class r it has to have been there for um 10 years so the original building as long as it was there for 10 years you can do class r on that at any point i suppose my my slide was trying to show use your ag pd rights to get a new ag building first and then do r on your old one yes yeah <laughs> as long uh, as it's been there for 10 years yeah okay um, just to jump in there the only thing to be aware of is obviously uh, in order to justify your part six pd right you need to show that the new building is necessary um uh, and so uh you don't want to be saying as part of that pd uh, part six application that you're going to leave an empty building on your site. No. So you no. you would do you do your, your, your part six reasonably necessary, and you'd, you'd make an argument that you need an additional shed, uh, and that's the reason that you do it in that order because you wouldn't want to do class R, and then show. Yeah. You potentially could, but I wouldn't like to do it. I wouldn't want to do a class R for the change of use and then try to ask for another one because it's reasonably necessary. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it comes down to the strategy. Um, for class R, can LPAs apply conditions, for example, vehicle weight, if highway officers are concerned about other uses being used in the future under class R? Oh, that is a good question. Quite specific. Um, so um, I've seen local authorities impose conditions um, and uh, so the power to impose conditions in the Town and Country Planning Act applies to grants of consent. Um, 
whether or not, uh, without getting too technical, the grant of consent for PD rights is in with it was within the GPDO, not a separate decision. So uh, whether or not those conditions are wholly reasonable and, and lawful, uh, I think is questionable, but I don't think it's ever been litigated to my mind. So um, local authorities do try and impose them. Yeah, I mean, they, yes, as, yeah, exactly, as, as Fred says, they can put conditions on. Highways is one of the things that they do, is, is one of the things that they can judge a Class R on. There's only three or four things under Class R that they can look at. Highways is one of them. So if the site is not suitable uh, from a highways perspective anyway, that's one of the reasons they can say no to a Class R. Um, again, most, the thing about highways is that it's fairly formulaic. And we can probably, if the client or the landowner has any concerns that it might not be suitable, we can do some pre-work, some technical work with a highways consultant or something to have a look at it if we think that's going to be an issue. So, um, yeah, I think Fred's right. I don't think I've particularly seen it, but it's not to say that a local authority might not try to. Mm, OK. Is it still minimum five hectares to qualify for AgriPD? I think it's more, is it, is that the minimum? Yeah. For, for, a, for a new building, yes. Um, there, there are separate PD rights that apply to sites of less than five hectares. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, we've just got one sort of specifically, do you operate throughout the UK? We're in North Yorkshire. The answer is yes, we're um, nationwide. So yes, we do. Um, and Thrings are nationwide. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, operate uh, myself I'm based in our Bristol office but um, I do work across the country including with clients in North Yorkshire up in Lancashire but I'm not uh, not constrained by location yes great so that's all the questions covered off um, have you got anything else to add or shall we finish there we, we've gone just over the hour so that's really useful. Finish. Thank you, Fred. Brilliant. So, yeah, so to yeah. say there will be a recording available afterwards and anybody who's registered, I'll get an email out to them with the link. Um, but to say thank you to Fred and Hannah for your, um, you know, invaluable contribution. It's really, really been an interesting webinar. And if anybody is looking for some help um, or would benefit from a planning, um, a chat about planning relating to their clients, we'd be more than happy to take their calls. But um, I think we'll finish there. So thank you very much. And hopefully you found it useful. Thank you. Thanks, Nicola. Thanks, Fred. Thank you. Thank you.